Good morning. Hi, Irene. Thank you for being here. Apologize. I had some computer password issues. I had to get through. That's okay. Get <laughs> Good morning. Anyway. Good afternoon, yeah, wherever you are. Well, it's morning here. Thank you for uh, for being here. Where are you located, by the way? I'm in Vancouver, BC. Oh, well, I'm just I'm I'm in uh, uh, Snohomish, Washington. So I'm probably oh gosh, two beautiful hours, two hours away or so from you. Um, mm -hmm. So let me just because I'm not sure that everyone is familiar with your background <clears throat> and your work. Would you mind uh, uh, filling us in on who you are and what you do? Yeah, definitely. Um, so. One little side note that I'm going to share, Sean, um, when I did my master's in research about 20 years ago, um, I'm going to just going to read you the title because we have a common connection. It was on the effects of meat consumption, red meat, and high intensity resistance training on skeletal muscle strength, muscle mass, and functional status in healthy older adults. So I know I'm not here to talk about meat and resistance training, but in my 20s, that's what I was studying. And then I got what was into, it. What was, what was yeah. the conclusion of that study? Just out of, yeah. out of curiosity. The conclusion, well, they were healthy adults, so they weren't malnourished in any way and they weren't frail. Um, but we, we um, gave one group quite a bit of red meat and lamb and the other just the regular diet. And the exercise intervention was so potent that dietary markers didn't change at all. And um, you know, cholesterol, all those things stayed exactly the same. So it was fun. And if anything, the, the muscle mass in these older folk increased, the strength increased by over a hundred percent, many of them. And it was actually the anecdotal evidence that we couldn't publish. That was my most favorite because it was their mental state that changed with the added resistance training and being in a group, you know, three times a week and learning a new skill. So I had to share that because that was like my first life and now I'm doing more trauma-based work, but yeah, it was a fun, fun yeah, study. It was in Australia. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think the point, the point is, you know, that you can continue to get stronger, even at any age. I've seen data now in, into nonagenarians <clears throat> or 90 year olds that are, that are putting yeah. on muscle at, at that age. So tell us a little bit. So the trauma stuff. So what, how did you yeah. get into that? Yeah. Well, I originally got into all this work due to some really bad orthopedic injuries, actually. I was a ski racer and um, had to, uh, in my career three ACL reconstructions, one, um, <laughs> one on the left knee twice, uh, patellar tendon graft. And then what really flipped me into this healing work was my kneecap, my patella spontaneous spontaneously fractured one day going down the stairs about three weeks post-op. And that really screwed my body up, even though I was young and fit and healthy, it just threw my mechanics off. And I had to look into alternative means to heal and to rehabilitate my system. I was a fitness trainer at the time, exercise science major, and all the stuff I was doing in PT wasn't working, even though I looked great and I was strong. So I started studying more, you know, back then it would have been considered woo woo stuff, <clears throat> but now it's just general neuroplasticity training. So I studied something called the Feldenkrais method, which isn't very well known in North America, um, but it's, it teaches people how to recover from things like CP, stroke, back injuries. And so I got into that work for my knee rehab and my body rehab. I became a practitioner. I started working with people who were really screwed up in their bodies due to injuries, accidents. And then about a year into that practice, um, there was about 50% of the people I was working with in the ski town I was in whom I was doing all the stuff the way I had taught myself to heal myself and it wasn't working with them. And as I started to get their histories, a lot of them had had some significant abuses growing up, traumas growing up. Um, one woman was in a propane explosion, so she was still recovering from like the pain of burn. Um, one gentleman had fallen off of a cliff, ski patrolling on the hill, and even though he had broken no bones, he was still in chronic pain two years later. And so at that point, Sean and everyone here, I started to ask questions about deeper aspects of the autonomic nervous system, how this stuff gets trapped in our tissues, how, you know, what, what really is PTSD? 
And so as I went down my path, I started to learn about the fact that humans have this capacity to trap trauma and the fight, flight, fight, flight, freeze responses in their body. And then when they don't heal that stuff at that level, it wreaks havoc on not just the tissues and the physiology, but the mental state, um, immune health and so on. So I got into some work called somatic experiencing, which is the work of Peter Levine, whom is an American. He's still old. He's still around. He's in his late seventies. And he really uncovered in the late sixties that animals in the wild don't tend to get PTSD. You know, they'll die from their injuries before they survive. And us humans, we do end up with PTSD and complex PTSD just because our higher brain overrides a lot of the healing responses um, that are kind of innate in us. And that uncover, was uncovered in my world in 2008. So since then, I've just been full steam ahead with the trauma work, working with the somatic system, but also blending my uh, m movement work in with it. And that's me. That's, that's been my work for 20 plus years. Well, that, that's some fascinating stuff. And I just, just, just relate to the, you know, the knee injury as, you know, as an orthopedic yeah. surgeon, obviously, you know, I'm certainly very familiar with, with your situation with the knee and it's, you know, when you start getting into revision ACLs, it's a problem for sure. But let me, okay. cause you, you mentioned a word neuroplasticity, which I think is a, an interesting, you know, concept. I mean, it's not a concept. We know it's occurring, but yep. what are you, I mean, what are we seeing with the remodeling, you know, or the, or the changes in brain pathways or, or physiology that mm -hmm. uh, is occurring with traumas? And I'm, I'm sure not, they're all not the same, but are there any commonalities that you see that, uh, that, that occur? Well, it's interesting when I'm working with my students now, um, I'm not putting them into any kind of EEG or scans or even blood markers to see what's changing. So I have speculation about what's going on in the actual central nervous system, but what I know is occurring in the peripheral nervous system, and I don't know if your students know the, the distinctions, but their, their ability to sense and act becomes much more dexterous in their bodies and not just gross mo movements, but uh, subtleties, uh, awarenesses. They are not bumping into things in the same way. They're not re-injuring themselves. They're actually feeling when they are tired or when they are hungry or when they are full. Um, they're learning how to, the fancy word would be regulate their autonomic nervous system physiology. So for example, just to give an example, cause that can help a lot of people struggle with what we would call anxiety, right? sympathetic arousal, um, this stress response where someone might feel pounding in the heart, tightness in the throat, butterflies in the stomach, um, just mental rumination. And what we know now through some pretty significant research called the ACE study, I don't know if you've ever come across that, Sean, um, it's the adverse childhood experiences study. The history of that study is, is insane. Um, but we now know that when a child is around a lot of stress growing up, a lot of uncertainty, and it doesn't have to be physical abuse. It could be war torn country. It could be mom is so busy because she's working five jobs and she just can't attend to her kiddos that creates a state of stress and that physiology. And then from there, um, if that kiddo doesn't get strong connections, support and learn how to self-regulate they're basically like a soup of fight flight responses. Um, and then that comes out later on in what we would call anxiety, but even more so a lot of the illnesses we're seeing now, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, autoimmune, um, Raynaud's, RSD, like really intense autoimmune and, and nervous system related stuff can be connected to this, this lack of safety and secure attachment growing up. Um, and so as my students start to learn how to be with their physiology and really what happens, Sean, is when you have a kiddo in that situation, they stop connecting to their body because it's too scary what they're feeling. They also stop connecting to what's around them. And so this is where we get folks that get dissociated. They kind of aren't really present. They're not present with their environment. They can't see what's around them. 
that puts them into danger of getting into accidents, not looking both ways when they cross the street, but it also doesn't give them clues that something's not right inside. And we also know through a lot of stuff that um, stored emotions, especially anger, um, is, a, is sort of like a time bomb for things like depression, cancer, autoimmune illness. So a lot of folks in our current mind body world are trying to just be, you know, love and light and peace and wellness. And that's important. Don't get me wrong. Like we're not wanting to go around being violent, but we also have to, as human mammals, learn how to get these anger responses out in a healthy way. Healthy aggression is what we would call it. Um, so the, the overarching way to answer your question is the way that I see these changes it's physiological, it's mental, but it's also relational. Like a lot of people, especially over the last couple of years have become afraid to engage, to go outside, to be with just social creatures in the way that we are. And that makes sense when you understand a person who grew up with an environment that was super unsafe and someone wasn't able to be themselves in front of their significant care caregivers. And then we start to kind of suppress and stop being who we are. And so another thing that my students will find is that they'll become just a little more brave. They'll become a little more boundaried. Um, they'll actually follow their impulses more. Um, interestingly enough, I've never seen a client go from being a meat eater to a vegetarian. I've always seen people go from vegetarian to eating meat. Um, I've yet to see a case where it, it goes that other way. And I just think people are becoming more connected to their humanity, their biology. And then the other thing for those here that have connection to spirit and soul, people naturally start to get a better soul spirit connection when they get into this physiology. It just starts, it's like it ripens everything, if that makes sense. Yeah, those are some interesting things. I, I, you know, a couple of comments, you know, I know when I, when I interviewed a guy named Malcolm Kendrick the other day, he was talking about cardiovascular disease and how important actual stress was in, in the development of that disease more so than I would have, would, than I would have thought. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. a very significant contributor. And the other thing um, that I was uh, thinking about is, you know, when I, I remember when I was in medical school, one of the things we were learning, you know, we were learning about our different cultural uh, considerations is that, you know, in particular, for some reason, it seemed like Asian people would manifest stress in a way that would often show up with a, a somatization. They would show up with like stomach pain and unusual, yep. weird, you know, yep. eye disturbance rather than, you know, express it a certain way. And I don't know if there's cultural, well, I'm sure there are norms on how you express your emotions, but um, do you see a lot of the somatic uh, manifestations of stress coming out and, 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 you know, how do we sort of, sort of diagnose that? And then of course, the yeah. answer would be, those, how do you, you know, how do you fix it? Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned those from Asia. Um, and this is just an observation that I've seen. Um, I live in Vancouver and there are many folks here from uh, China, Korea, Vietnam. There is a very interesting, um, I'm going to assume, you know, what a tick or Tourette's is where there's like a, a, a you see that a lot in folks who have been blown up and like IED explosions and, and war, you know, where there's big bombs and that. But what I've seen in a lot of the, the Asian folk around me is they'll have these, uh, and I'll do it with my eyes so you can see it. It's like this very quick blink like that. And what I think that is connected to, because I'm also around a lot of folks, is it's a, the very harsh way in which a lot of communication happens between the parent and the child. And I also know from going to university with a lot of uh, kiddos and teenagers who had very strict upbringings, um, when you have this rule, it's like almost an authoritarian rule on you, you stop to feel, you stop feeling what's going on inside. And so your word, the somatization of symptoms, um, you know, there's a classic book by a MD called When the Body Says No by Gabor Mate. He's, he's writes on addiction and chronic illness and ADD, really good book. And basically the body will say no in the form of an illness, a symptom, a rash. I saw someone mentioned here, uh, MS. There's some very, very strong connections with MS and repression of emotion, repression of anger, not um, speaking up for oneself. Women tend to fall into this a bit more where they do everything 
for everyone and they kind of put themselves last. It's a very common uh, thing that this physician saw with his patients in palliative care and they were like in their 40s, 50s, dying really young. And even on their deathbed, they were apologizing for putting their families out for being so sick. And so, you know, the other things that we'll see um, will be chronic pain. You know, the amount of people I've worked with whom have been in say accidents, car accidents where they want to do a defensive movement, Sean, like turn the steering wheel to get out of the way or slam on the brake. And for whatever reason, maybe there was a kid in front of the car or they couldn't. Um, and that procedural memory is what we call it gets trapped in the physiology. And then I worked with folks who have had chronic hip flexor pain for years. And then we get into that car accident and we, we don't relive it, but we play out the movements that maybe they couldn't do. Strong physical movements of protection, fight, flight. And when those movements, those procedural memories start to move out, um, there's a freeing up in the tissue and the fascia. It's the same with kids that have been hit, for example, or people that have been attacked and held down, even surgeries. I don't know if you were ever in the surgical arena where someone woke up in the middle of surgery, that happens, or um, someone has to be held down because they're, they're freaking out. Often it's kids like that and they get held down because they have to. But in many cases later in life, that stored fight flight energy can create these, these autoimmune conditions, these physical symptoms. Um, so to answer your question about, um, how does one fix this? What I have found is that really teaching my students how to apprentice and be with their bodies, but also understand the deep physiology of how trauma gets stuck in the system and what to look for. And to just give you an example, the other day I was working with someone, um, it was a close friend whom had a really significant uh, fever actually. And, you know, the fever was playing out the course and, but she was getting really anxious about it because of just everything that she's been seeing in the media around being sick. And so I just said to her, as I watched her, I saw her starting to calm her breath down, which we often do, you know, we'll, we'll take a long exhale to calm down. And I said to her, what would it be like if you didn't actually do that? And if you just felt your heart beating really fast and just be with it. And I had her just touch that area and connect the same way a mother who cares for her child really well, if they have a tummy ache, a mom's gonna pick up their kid and just, you know, maybe rub the tummy or, or connect with that little one. Um, and she did this, she connected. And as soon as she did, um, there was this tingling that just left her arms down her legs, the, it was almost like it hit a threshold. It went down um, and I can't, you know, take ownership for her fever going away, but the next day it shifted and she had had like a fever of 102 for five days. Um, so one of the, the hallmarks, as I said, is learning how to kind of connect to the system. And I teach it in a way that is not just mindfulness and meditation. It's nothing like that. It's actually bringing in um, a lot of osteopathic traditions of working with the joints, the different levels of the diaphragms, um, breath, but not changing the breath, learning how to expand the lungs um, into the pelvis, into the shoulders. I take my Feldenkrais background, lots of gentle movement, lots of aware movement. Um, and also teaching people how to um, be with what I call the stress organs. So one branch of my work is, is, is actually putting intention and, and focus on the kidneys and the adrenals, the brain stem, the gut, the gut brain connection, working with the vagus nerve to help um, either stimulate it or calm it through various sound and vibration. Um, and with this kind of, a uh, symphony, you would say, of all this connection, a person starts to get better at what's called their interoception, which is just our perception of our internal environment. And then what occurs is they start to notice when they are stressed, as opposed to just overriding that tightness in their gut, they actually can feel it. It doesn't mean they have to stop for five hours and meditate, but they're just like, oh, shit, I'm clenching my gut. Maybe I should 
shift that because it's actually causing my heart above to feel more tense or vice versa. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, you know, I, I just, just a couple sort of comments on that. You know, I, I remember when I was competing in, in, in high level competitive rowing and I was training with one of the Olympic gold medalists and we were doing exercises and my heart, you know, we were monitoring my heart rate and he was just telling me if you breathe a certain way, you can, you can actually lower your heart rate during this activity. And, and, and that was something that, you know, provided me first time I really thought about that feedback, but you hear, you know, I, you may be familiar with a guy named Wim Hof who does a yeah. lot of cold immersion and does a lot of breath work. And it's, and, and there's these, you know, famous yogis that, that have it seemingly voluntary control over what's supposed to be the autonomic nervous system, yes. you know, which, which controls, you know, through sympathetic, sympathetic activity, heart rate, blood pressure, um, digestive function, you know, background breathing rate. Are you finding that, uh, is there some feedback that you do that, that modulates the autonomic nervous system through, through different activities, whether it's breathing, focus, meditation, mm -hmm. motion in some ways? And, and is that something that, because I think some of these things, you know, we think, uh, um, these background processes are completely independent of what we want to do about them. And sometimes yeah. they are maladaptive and we, and it, it shows up with problems. So how do you, do you, or how, and if you do, how do you modulate those things? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, because I know breath work has become really popular as have um, cold uh, plunges and immersions to kind of shock the system. And I'm all for that. Um, I have a cold tub in my backyard here, but what I've seen, so the, the word that I was trying to get to, um, and you reminded me of it is biofeedback. You know, so people will go to someone to do neuro or biofeedback and they'll watch, you know, the commute computer monitor and the person will teach them how to shift their breathing, the tension in their body, and they'll actually see the changes. And so what I'm finding with the blending of my work in the, the methodologies that I'm working with is someone is learning how to do their own biofeedback, but without the computer monitor or without the coach there. The other thing is, how do I say this? <laughs> A lot of the, the methods, the breath, the tapping, the cold, their tools and they're really good methodologies. And a lot of the times what we're seeing is they're managing the physiology. They're not teaching it how to have actual full regulation on its own. And so what often occurs, um, and this is just, I think no one's fault other than we're just learning more about this, is that part of healing trauma and getting these fight flight and freeze, this is, I don't know if your students here know about the freeze response, but it's that shutdown deep parasympathetic that many of us live in in a functional way and we don't know it. And so when we're in that more kind of numbed out, I can conquer anything kind of, I was that kid. Like I used to paraglide and ski off of cliffs and do all these crazy things. And it took a lot of adrenaline to get me going. And I realized it was all my shutdown responses from growing up in a very emotionally numb uh, household. Um, and what, what we find is that if we're just managing, let's say the anxiety, I'll use that example, it's actually not hitting a thermostatic reset and expressing the stored fight flight that's in there from that time when we were held down as a kid or from the many, many times we felt unsafe at the kitchen dinner table or take your pick, the school bully, whatever it is. And so part of the work, believe it or not, is building up enough um, biofeedback capacity, if you wanna call it connecting with the body so that a person can actually feel the intensity that they didn't have the skill or the regulation to hold when they were younger. The other thing, Sean, that, and I'm just going to put this in here because it's rarely talked about, and I think it's important, is some people might not have any memory of any trauma. They, and they will actually say, I actually had a roof over my head. I had food on the table. Mom and dad were, you know, fairly okay with each other. Um, but if someone had maybe um, surgeries, multiple surgeries when they were an infant, or there was a birth trauma where you lost oxygen due to an umbilical cord being wrapped around the neck, 
even forcep births and, and that where a kiddo is being pulled out can put the physiology into extreme shutdown stress. And then they survive, but there's this um, underlying tone of danger in the cells. And this is very common in those that have really chronic um, autoimmune conditions, fibromyalgia, and even real deep depression. And they just can't think of a trauma that happened to them. And there's actually no fight response needing to get out. But what's occurring is this very low level sense of I'm not safe, I'm not safe. Even though they know there's no one in their household trying to get them, they have this edge to them. Um, it's kind of like, a, uh, you know, if you think of um, dogs and cats, my parents were both veterinarians. And so when I was a kid, I could tell if the owners were calm at home because the, the dogs or the cats would be more skittish. You know, they would have this overall quality of unsafety or they were maybe in an abusive situation and then they were a rescue animal. And a lot of humans are in a sense living in this state of chronic fear, but they actually don't know it because that's what they've always had um, until they realize that a lot of their um, fear is turning into chronic conditions. Um, so there's a lot of avenues there. There's also um, what is a real thing we've seen in the research is transgenerational trauma. So traumas are passed down through lineages. We've seen this through research that was done post Holocaust and post 9-11 with um, kiddos that were in utero during 9-11, for example. Um, and I'm probably sure we're gonna see some interesting stuff after the next two years, you know, into the next 10 years with babies that are being born right now with just the stress of everything going on. I'm not sure if I answered your question. I went on a bit of a tangent there, but let me know. No, I think that's, that's good. I want to just, you know, I mean, because I'm thinking about, you know, I mean, human beings have experienced trauma since we've existed. I mean, it's mm -hmm. trauma's not new. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, when we were hunter gatherers, there'd be a time when people were killed various ways. You yeah. know, it, it was a stressful life. And so my assumption was that, you know, I mean, and really all animals are have to deal with some sort of trauma, whether it's physical or stressful in another way. And, you know, the, the stress of physicality uh, is, is also stress, you know, when you're, when you're worried about something happening to yeah. you. And, uh, and so, but now it seems like, and maybe we're just better at diagnosing it and maybe we look for it more, but is the environment getting worse for this now? Or is there something yeah. else going on? Is it the, 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 the nutrition environment, the, the, the lifestyle environment that's exacerbating these things that we can't, adapt because i would assume you know you know if, if god or whoever gave us a life that's going to be filled with trauma he gave us the tools and the, and the physiology to to deal with those resources and maybe that's being uh uh diminished due to other things in the environment is that fair yeah. to say totally i think there's a lot there's obviously um you know you mentioned hunter gatherers so when we domesticated plants and animals ten thousand years ago we stopped that hunting and gathering and being nomadic going with the seasons, going with the light. And we started to, you know, put things into pens and farm and stay put. So that was one thing. And then of course we industrialized and we had electricity and we weren't, we weren't living off of the land in the same way. And then, you know, and I'm kind of speeding up, but once we started to really, um, you know, medicalize birth and kind of teach parents to not trust their intuition. And these are the ways you're supposed to feed your baby. These are the ways you're supposed to train them to sleep. It took the natural instinct out of that bond between let's just say mother and child. And um, I can't tell you how many moms I've worked with, for example, whose pediatricians have taught them to, um, for instance, um, let their babies cry themselves to sleep. This was a very common thing. Even when I was um, a child and probably when you were, um, they, but they just, we just didn't know. And so this, this exit, if you will, from more natural means, I think nutrition is obviously a huge part of it. All of the crap in our food, all of the fake oils and all these things, our lack of exposure to sun, fresh air, 
being in um, working mode with our body, you know, throughout the day, um, technology, EMFs, all that stuff. But I really think there's just been this disconnect from our physiology due to a lot of kind of rules, if you will. The, the crying it out one of babies is one of the more devastating things I think that occurred to us. Cause when that little one is not being attended to when they are um, fussy or hungry or just need care and connection, their physiology is spiking into sympathetic. And it'll either stay that way from what we've seen or it'll collapse into what we would call a dorsal shutdown response and they kind of go limp. Um, actually, there's a great Netflix series called Manhunt. Did you ever come across that? It was the story of the Unabomber and Ted Kaczynski. That story is fascinating because they don't talk about it in that. But my mentor, Peter, interviewed his mother. And when Ted when Theodore was, I think, like really young, a couple months old, he came down with this insane uh, rash all over his body, hives. And I don't know what year this would have, been, would have been, but they took him to the hospital and they left him there for, I think it was seven days, strapped to a table alone. And I'm sure they went in to treat him. They probably gave him cortico, you know, steroids to take the inflammation down. And she says, and he writes about this in um, his book um, on ch a child rearing, I can't remember the title right now. When she got her little Teddy, I'll never forget it, she brought him home and he was never the same since. He was just this limp baby that was despondent, wouldn't really engage. And so that is a classic sign of that little system going into total shutdown. And then he stayed alive, obviously. And in the Netflix series, they show him as a child being a little uh, disturber, like trying to instigate fights, trying like he was literally making bombs in class. But my sense is when I worked with people who have been really harmed as infants, they have a very sadistic, vindictive desire to, to get, get at someone because someone treated them poorly. And then if you know how his history was he was in Harvard and he was strapped down to chairs and was under um, uh, research by the CIA and all sorts of stuff where they did things that were really bad to him. And that was kind of his breaking point is when his professors lied to him about why they were being friendly to him. They were studying basically mind control. And isn't it interesting that now he's in solitary confinement the way he was when he was an infant confined alone in a hospital room. It's just devastating, See, but you hear these stories and you track back, you trace back what actually happened. And a lot of it can get connected to early physiological threat. Um, and I've worked with clients whom have, have had horrific things done to them. And the way to get that out is you actually have to help them get that fight flight freeze out of the system in a very safe way where they're not hurting themselves or me or anything else, um, but really expressing that rage, that animal in them. And so to go back to your question, why, why are we not getting this stuff out? I think it's really a cumulative effect too. People aren't playing, kids aren't playing the way they used to play fighting. They're not, we're not rough and tumbling, you know, within good measure. We're not out um, doing the things that say I did when I was a kid, always out, always playing, always getting into trouble with friends in, in good ways. Um, a lot of this stuff can get um, processed through play, through expression, through movement. If we think of cultures, uh, South American, African, even Asian. Uh, my mother's from the Philippines. So I've been in these cultures where people dance and they clap and they're eating and they're, they're moving their bodies. I think a lot of those cultures are naturally getting the trauma out through their daily practices. And then we have more Western culture where people are, you know, ashamed if they trip on the street and stumble a little bit. You know, they go into these shame responses like, well, you just you just tripped on something. But it shows how um, afraid we are of our physiology and even um, little things like 
burping and farting, I'm being descript, but it's like we are teaching kids to be ashamed of their bodily functions. And a lot of my clients, when I was in private practice, they had trouble getting their anger and emotions out. And there's certainly no way they would never have, you know, passed gas in front of me or burped, or if they did, you know, they'll blush and get all embarrassed. So it just shows how disconnected we are from that physiology. So I can go on and on, but the stories that I see a lot of it connects this lack of being able to process is just this lack of connection to self, deep shame that a lot of us were brought up with. And for many, just not being raised to be little healthy human animals with obviously a higher brain that's super, super complex. Um, let me know if that's making sense. I can see some comments coming in here. Um, I, you know, it's kind of a shame. I remember I read a book this summer, uh, actually Joe Rogan had recommended to me Empire of the Summer Moon. And one of the things, I don't know if you've read the book, but it's pretty graphic and it, it details a, sort of the Comanche population. Mm. One of the things that, that I remember about this is that, you know, when there was a significant trauma, like someone was killed, uh, he commented that the women would often be wailing and they would actually be cutting themselves, cutting their breasts, cutting their arms. Sure. Uh, deal with this and now you said you know how do you deal with this out without injuring yourself obviously you're not you were not recommending people slice themselves no. open but this is a way they dealt with acute stress and you mentioned you know dancing and playing and, and you know for, for maybe the little smaller things that are occurring on a day-to-day -day. because every, yeah. you know, every day you encounter something that's stressful or annoys you and if you have a way to, to deal with it but how does like let's say someone who comes from a like a really stressful event you know a violence a trauma a rape mm -hmm. uh, whatever you know, something that's kind of you know obviously affect them for the rest of their life likely. What is the acute answer to that? Is there an acute way to say, this is how we got to deal with this in a safe way that's going to minimize the negative impact and, and cause yeah. you know, the pathways in the brain? How do we deal with that? Yeah, so there's a few, two answers. So if someone's just had, let's, I'll just use a, like a severe car wreck, you know, and, and they're not having to go into surgery due to crush injuries and that kind of thing, but they're really shooken up. Um, the first thing is for the person to really, and again, I'll just assume they're by themselves, um, to really reconnect to the ground. This isn't grounding necessarily, but like everyone here is probably sitting on a chair or standing up. Like, can you feel the chair under your butt? Can you feel how your hands are on your lap? Um, can you feel the hat on your head and the connection to it? Um, just reconnecting to in the moment, because when we've had something really traumatic and stressful, it pops us out of the here and now. And so that basic connection, the second thing would be to allow the person to go into whatever they're feeling. And here's what's interesting, Sean, is if a kid was never taught to like be okay with pain, or you know, falling off of their bike and they're scooped up right away and the parents like, you're okay, you're okay, you're fine, get back on your bike, keep going. An adult who's 35 or 46 like myself, they might not know how to even feel the physiology that's going berserk. And so I wish there was a straight answer, but it depends on the person's language internally to even track their physiology. So someone might, might be able to feel that and track it and then they'll feel like a bubble. I mean, I've been in some accidents and I sometimes wanna cry, you know, like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna tear up or you go red or you get mad. Um, some people might need to go see someone. Someone might need a hug, just like, okay, I can feel myself. You know, a lot of folk um, do well with, things like weighted blankets and vests that are a little snug and dogs, for instance, horses that need a little containment, it helps them to have clothing on them or ties to give them that proprioceptive feedback. <clears throat> so those are some things. And then the other thing too, is for a person after say an accident to ground themselves, but also look around literally in their environment, see the space around them and be like, I'm here, I'm alive. These can be very powerful words for people. I'm alive, I'm sur I survived and I'm okay, or some version of that. But saying it out and really meaning it. And I've worked with some folk who have, you know, had horrific abuse accidents and they actually think that they're still 
in the traumatic event. And so to be able to kind of tease apart, here I am, this is me, hands on the body. I'm here, I'm alive, I'm safe, I survived. And then, uh, and this might be something that you do acutely, or it might be something that comes up later, is to really ask the question, but feel the question, if I could have done something to have avoided that, what would it have been? And maybe it was, you know, steering the wheel a different direction, slamming on the brake, slamming or, or accelerating. Maybe if it was an attack, it's like, I would have taken that baseball bat and just, you know, hit them or something, or I would have run out of the doctor's office, like down the road to my favorite tree. Like it can also be imaginative to let the person's physiology experience um, triumph in a way, being victor, you know, victorious, getting out of that crappy situation. Um, and then the other thing I will ask, add is, let's say someone has a horrific car accident, um, I, and I've worked with this a lot, and the symptoms and the stress, and we would call it complex PTSD afterwards, they don't match up with the severity of the accident. So I've worked with people who have had, say, the tiniest fender bender, and they walk away as if they just came out of a war zone. And so then the question is, well, what the heck's going on there? And what we know, I mentioned that um, study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study earlier, what we see is when we look back, we find out that that person was kind of like a, a ticking time bomb to begin with. Like I have a glass of water here. It's like their cup was completely full with stress, but they had no idea because they were numbed out. It's like the Ted Kaczynski example. And then they have this car accident and it just, everything explodes. And then they end up with digestive troubles, all sorts of things that um, they didn't have before, but it was trapped within the system. So in a case like that, um, we might not be able to touch into that accident because it's just too triggering. That's where we have to do more gentle work. I mentioned working with the stress organs, the kidneys, the adrenals, there might be some gentle touch to just really calm and contain and bring the system back to we're here. Yes, that was scary and you're, you're safe, you're okay. Um, and that work, I'll be honest, can take sometimes up to two years for someone who has had that level of early trauma um, to just not just calm it, uh, Sean, but restore regulation back to the system. And then once there's a bit more foundation on board, then we might tackle the car accident. But more often than not, by doing the gentle restorative work, almost like teaching that person to be a child again and just really subtle, um, sometimes these, these um, accidents just dissolve on their own, right? So you asked that question a little while ago, why are so many people traumatized now and have these problems a lot of it is tying back to how we were raised as kiddos, how stressed was mom when she cared, was carrying us. Um, were we with our mothers or a primary caregiver or were we handed off to daycare immediately? Um, and when we look at cultures um, who have long maternity and paternity leave, those nations usually have much more regulated humans. Um, Iceland is one that's been highlighted in the past. Um, great book by Dr. Bruce Perry called Born for Love. I don't know if this is still the case. This book was written in the 90s, but in the 90s, there were no prisons in Iceland. They didn't need them. There was no crime. There was very little violence. There was what's called very high um, social connection. And there, there's, and a, a lot of it was tied to how much time an infant got to spend with their primary caregiver in that first year of life. And often it was up to two years that the parents could be with the kid, just being with them, teaching them safety. And that just solidifies really the foundation for the rest of life. So when we look at countries, I know America is a little different than Canada, but we're kind of similar. Like not everybody gets maternity leave that's paid. You know, and then you have to make a decision and that slowly over time affects the population. 
Yeah, I just, uh, I wanted to, so, I mean, Iceland, I mean, it's interesting, but there's this 300,000 people that live in Iceland, so it's not a big place. It's so, small. I mean, you know, it, you wouldn't expect to be a lot of prisons in that size population. <laughs> let me ask you about, because we've talked about, you know, you know, some of the response. What about, what about prophylaxis? I mean, I mean, because all of us are going to experience some trauma, yeah. I mean, a death of a loved one is going to happen, a car accident is going to happen to all of us in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. How do we sort of imbue us with the resilience so that we can deal with this stuff. Cause you mentioned the, the cup being overflowing or yeah. almost overflowing. You can't even take the little, you can't even take a joke at that point. How do you get to a place where you're like, Hey, stress is going to happen, but I'm ready for it. Yeah. So that's where, um, that's a great question. Um, I used to be less into this, but now I am a bit more as I've aged is having some form of daily practice that obviously involves activity, movement, but also slowing down and really as simple as it is, connecting and feeling the ground, letting your eyes orient and see the space around. It's actually one of the first practices we teach my students um, is restoring the orienting response and letting the eyes really, because the eyes are part of the brain, like can the visual systems chill a little bit can you see far? Can you see wide? Can you see your periphery? Um, and then depending on the person, Sean, and this is where it, there is no one size fits all with this, is a person will know usually how much stuff they have trapped. They'll know their childhood was good or not good. They'll know the amount of surgeries they've had, all these things. And so depending on your unique um, blueprint, if you will, um, are there some things that you haven't talked about? Are there some things that you are trapped inside with? This doesn't mean you have to go to a therapist and, you know, put it all out, but even for yourself, like, can you acknowledge with yourself or your significant other or a friend or a journal? These are the things that really hurt me when I was young. It's not about a poor me situation. It's about a relying or a, a creating a resiliency so that we're not trapping this stuff in. Um, and then as crazy as it sounds, I'm starting to listen to your physiology now. So I have a feeling your folk are pretty good at listening to their bodies. So keep doing that. But even things like, do you sit at your computer and you know, you have to go pee and you don't get up, you know, and there's a toilet right there. As crazy as that is, when we ignore that, the system is realizing that we're not listening to it. Um, so that's one example. Um, noticing movement, noticing, you know, when you're sitting watching a show, are your fists clenched? Is your groin tight? Is your belly tight? Like you're trying to suck your stomach in to show everyone how slim you are. It, these things like, is there a tension in the system that doesn't need to be there? And then the, the, the third thing, if you do get um, little hurts, little harms, you know, everybody every now and again might burn their finger on the toaster oven or stub their toe on a piece of something that's in the wrong place. When something like that happens, use that as an opportunity, almost like medicine to stop. It doesn't have to be for long. It'd be like 10 seconds and feel that the pain of that burn or that stubbed toe and actually say, okay, I feel that. It's not about, again, poor me. It's just like, I'm feeling that. I feel the zing coming through my body, feel the ground orient and then go about your day. If someone cuts you off in traffic and you're pissed off rather than going after them, like let the scream out in your car, you know, hold the steering wheel and real, but don't keep it in. And then of course we have to be discerning. We don't want to get mad at our kids or hit our dog or anything like that. You know, so if something is coming up, that's really intense or it's a memory, if you can't get it out in that moment, make a note of it. And when you're alone, when you can move that energy out. So by not allowing stuff to stick from this day forward, it actually helps the old stuff bubble up. And a person who has a lot of current day stress, the system has a weird way of knowing we can't handle this right now. And a lot of my clients will say it was so strange. I didn't start to get all of these memories of my abusive past until I was in a safe relationship. I hear this all 
the time. And they're like, I don't get it. I'm now in a good relationship. I have money in the bank. Everything is great. And now my system's just going crazy. That is because the system is safer, if that makes sense. And the system will not express that stuff until there's greater safety on board. So that's kind of a overarching example, connecting to the moment, connecting to the body, following the impulse, not letting any little stressors stick and acknowledging, okay, what have I not dealt with that's keeping my system a little on edge? Well, Irene, unfortunately we've run out of time, um, but this is very, very fascinating. And I'm sure there's other people that want to learn more. So where can they go to learn out and learn more yeah. about you or about some of the stuff you're talking about? Sure. Uh, just my name. So Irene, I-R-E-N-E, Lion with a Y, no S. Um, that's my site. I'm on all the social media. I've got hundreds of YouTube videos, um, courses, uh, trainings, classes, eBooks, audio samplers. So if you go to my site, you can download something right away and actually do a little practice with me. Um, and then once a year, we run a big program that starts uh, March, early March. So that'll start uh, opening up for registration in three weeks, actually, very soon. So that is me. Thank you. I've been seeing some questions. And if you have questions, just come over to the site. YouTube is where my team and I answer questions. So if you have a question about anything health related, just Google it or put it into YouTube and it'll probably pop up. I saw some questions about, um, I think, MS uh, and tin tinnitus and a few other things. Um, someone mentioned Agent Orange and chemical trauma. That's a real thing. I actually was exposed to a lot of chemicals growing up and my mother was exposed to DDT um, when she was a young girl. So that's also another thing that can really throw our system off. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sean. Good to meet you. Yeah, and likewise, thank you very much. And uh, again, like like I said, uh, have a have a great time, and thanks for doing what you're doing. Yeah. Um, for the rest of you guys, we'll be back tomorrow. So you guys take care, and we'll see you guys later. Thanks so much. Thanks, hey, everyone. Thanks, Sean. Join Rivero.Health for a 30-day free trial to get access to live Q&A with VIP guests, social community meetings, member discounts, low-carb healthcare providers list, forum, workouts, monthly challenges, early access to podcasts, recipes, carnivore diet guide, fasting guide, shred guide, and much more. 